we're going to start to my direct uh, right with Professor Craig Haney. Uh, Dr. Haney, as a longtime researcher on solitary, what are the most profound physical and psychological effects you have identified? Well, Carrie, um, we've, um, we've known for about 150 years that solitary confinement was harmful to human mental and physical health. Um, there is a robust literature on this issue. Um, it's uh, a consistent literature, incidentally, uh, notwithstanding a few outlier studies at all. All of the literature points to virtually the same thing. I can tell you that from my own experience in doing this kind of research over the last 40 years, the one unmistakable uh, description that I can provide you with about what happens to people in solitary confinement is that there is a deep and broad suffering which takes place in these units. Um, people are in pain uh, in solitary confinement. The studies, some of which I've done, many of which other people have, have also contributed to, um, describe the dimensions uh, in a variety of different ways. But let me, let me pick just four that I think are most important. The first and perhaps most obvious thing that happens to many people who are in solitary confinement is they, they're overcome with a sense of hopelessness and despair, which oftentimes turns into forms of clinical depression. They are deprived of meaning, of meaningful contact, of meaningful activities, and many of them turn that inward, um, begin to feel terrible, horrible, uh, become mired in despair. Other prisoners, and sometimes the same prisoners at different points in time, begin to feel uh, anger. Um, many people go into solitary confinement already angry. There is nothing about the experience which makes most of them any less angry. The anger deepens, and it also, unfortunately, tends to become focused, focused on the people who are doing these things to them. Um, and so the effect is oftentimes counterproductive, uh, the opposite of what is intended. In addition, um, there is a, another kind of change that takes place in people, especially when people are in solitary confinement over a longer period of time. But, but even for people in short-term solitary confinement, we are all social beings in ways that we don't understand or appreciate until social, meaningful social contact is denied to us. Uh, we understand who we are, what we are. We understand our feelings, our thought processes. All of these things are rooted in social interaction. And when social interaction is taken away from us, it destabilizes us. It destabilizes our relationship to the world, to other people, and to ourselves. Uh, Nick mentioned Nelson Mandela, and many of you know that Nelson Mandela wrote that of all of the terrible horrors that he experienced in prison, the most forbidding of all was solitary confinement because, he said, it caused him to question literally everything, by which he meant question literally who he was, who he was in the world, who he was in relationship to other people. And prisoners in solitary confinement begin to be destabilized in terms of their sense of their self. You heard about uh, the, the tragic story of, of Khalif uh, Browder, who, who came out of solitary confinement not knowing who he was in the world and being uncomfortable around other people. And that's the fourth and the final characteristic effect of, of this kind of treatment and these kinds of experiences, is that people <coughs> begin in a somewhat paradoxical but very understandable way to first thirst for human contact and to feel pain in the absence of human contact, but then begin subtly but inexorably to adapt to the absence of human contact. So much so that human contact becomes aversive to them. They find themselves never comfortable, never fully comfortable in the presence of other people. Now I hasten to add that not everybody experiences all of these things in exactly the same way, and some people who with remarkable resiliency manage to come out relatively unscathed from these experiences. But the suffering, nonetheless, which they are sometimes able to put behind them, is suffering which is palpable and which they endure during the period of time that they are confined in these ways. So anger, despair, alienation, <coughs> what did you find, what has your research uncovered with regard to people who went into solitary confinement already suffering from some kind of mental illness? What are you finding about incidents of self-harm and, and other factors? So this is a, a, prof a profoundly important issue. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know that there is a very large percentage of people who are in solitary confinement who are mentally ill. Um, it's not difficult to understand how the dimensions of mental illness 
and the dynamics and contingencies of prison life interact with one another to r result in a high concentration of mentally ill people being put in solitary confinement. If prison systems do not conscientiously and proactively exclude the mentally ill from solitary confinement units, then large percentage of them, of them will be there. Most estimates suggest that uh, 30 or more percent of the people who are in, who are in solitary confinement suffer from pre-existing mental illness. There are several reasons why this is a particularly dangerous and damaging phenomenon. Um, the first, uh, and perhaps most obvious, is that the, the, the mentally ill are vulnerable. And the stress of solitary confinement is felt acute, acutely by vulnerable populations, the young, the, the old, and, and the mentally ill especially. The, the, other, the other thing that happens in solitary confinement is that many of, the, uh, many of the consequences or psychological impacts of solitary confinement amplify the very symptoms of mental illness. So I talked about depression. I talked about anger. Uh, I talked about a destabilization of a sense of self. These are things that happen to healthy people, um, and they add on or, or aggregate already existing dimensions or symptoms of, of, of mental illness. Um, it's also the case that uh, mental health care is difficult to deliver in most solitary confinement units. Um, and so you, you find people who go in with or develop various forms of mental illness, and oftentimes they are untreated. They are oftentimes un, unrecognized uh, as suffering from mental illness. Um, instances of suicide and self-harm are much higher in these units than elsewhere. In some jurisdictions, Solitary confinement represents 5 to 10 percent of the population in the prison system and as much as 50 to 75 percent of the suicides. Um, the research on self-harm is similar. Um, interesting study out of New York, for example, that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Instances of self-harm six to seven times more likely in solitary confinement units. So these units are harmful, dangerous, uh, create damage and despair in everyone in varying degrees but especially those people who are vulnerable and especially those people who are mentally ill. Thank you. Some powerful research there from Professor Haney. We're going to move on to Shaka Sangor of Cut50. Um, you, you're here with uh, some interesting personal experience. Can you talk about how you got into solitary and what it felt like to be there? Well, first, I want to just thank uh, Craig Haney for those amazing insights uh, and so I, th I think one of the great things about this panel is it's interesting to hear all the data um, but what does that data look like and how does that play out in everyday life inside solitary confinement um, so I served 19 years in prison out of the 19 years I served seven of that was in solitary confinement um, and it was a total of seven years I did four and a half years straight from 1999 to 2004 and I can tell you from my personal experience, just actually hearing um, Dr. Haney's remarks about what it's designed to do, um, it was almost like re-traumatizing because I've been home for five years now and I've been able to kind of move on to some degree uh, with the exception of when Khalif Browder committed suicide, which was something that really touched me on a very personal level. But I got into solitary confinement, I went to prison I was young, I was 19 years old, I was very bitter, I was very angry, I was very rebellious. Um, prison is a very volatile environment um, and you kind of go in with the understanding that you'll be a lion or a lamb. I chose to be a lion, there's consequences for being a lion uh, and those consequences are oftentimes trips to solitary confinement. The last thing I did in 1999 was a result of a conflict that I got into with a um, correctional officer and it's by far one of the things that if you're in prison, you know, that's the, pretty much the worst thing you can do is get into a conflict with a with a, with an officer. Um, and not to get into the particulars, you know, um, there are officers who abuse their authority. Um, I felt that he did something inappropriate, which was putting his hands on me, and so I responded to that, and, and the consequence was solitary confinement. One of the things that I am constantly reminded of anytime we had this discussion is the smell. So there's two things, it's the smell and it's the sound. And the smell is, 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 is that of um, human despair, chaos, and hopelessness. And it manifests through 
um, men who are suffering from mental illness throwing feces on the chair, throwing feces on each other. Um, you know, that's mingled with the smell of pepper spray, which is often used to subdue uh, men who have been considered uh, rebellious toward the environment. And then it's mixed with that of, of the smell of the shower at the end of the tear, which is disgusting. Um, so that's one of the things that really I think about, right? But then there's also this other smell that I think about, and it came from a guy who was like two cells down from me setting himself on fire. And for the days leading up to him setting himself on fire, he was harassed every day by the guards for his sexuality. Uh, he was oftentimes deprived of food and in a sense of desperation, he literally set the cell on fire with himself in it. Um, and fortunately there was an officer there who reacted, uh, you know, relatively swiftly and put the fire out so they put him in the suicide watch cell for like two days and they returned him to the to the cell and then it repeated over and over the same thing and then he set himself on fire again and so that smell is one of the things that i think about often when i think about solitary confinement and having these conversations has been very difficult lately um Largely because I know that there are thousands of, of men and women who we have completely uh, disregarded their humanity. And it's, it's even more disheartening now that I'm free and that I get an opportunity to move in spaces that, you know, most people coming out of my environment would never be able to move in. And I can see that we have every tool available for us to make the right decisions about how we treat the, some of the most vulnerable people, especially those dealing with mental illness. <laughs> And it's tragic. I think this is one of America's greatest shames, is what we do to men and women who are in solitary confinement. You know, most of us who end up in prison, we come from environments of brokenness. You know, I grew up in an abusive home. Uh, I got shot multiple times when I was 17, never received any type of uh, treatment for that. And so it repeats this cycle of violence and chaos and disorder in our community. And then you take a person that's a child. The first time I went in solitary confinement, I was 19 years old and you throw them in this environment, and then there's no exit strategy. It's so arbitrary, it's just like one day they wake up and say, oh, well, you know what, we think you suffered long enough, we think you've been in hell long enough, so here, we'll let you out and I'll go and be a normal person. Um, one of the most alarming things for me is I watched a guy who I knew go straight home from solitary confinement. And there was every indication and every implication that this guy has suffered psychologically on so many different levels and now he's somebody's neighbor now he's back in the community where he could potentially you know create chaos because this is what has been poured into him logically there is nothing about solitary confinement that's helpful other than this so you know it can it may be able to you know solve a problem in the short term or just to separate people but everything about it is designed to break like every part of you know your spirit you know so that that was my experience i don't think i've ever been so haunted and moved by anything in my time in washington thank you for sharing your experience mm -hmm. and and its implications for lots of other people around the country mm -hmm. um <laughs> hard to hard to follow that rick ramish but um, you came in in Colorado wanting to make some big changes to the practices there. What was your motivation for doing that? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, all of us in my position stand up and we slam our fists on the table and say, and fill the state in, that we run the largest mental health institution in our state. And we do. And then each morning I had to look in the mirror and think, well, what did I do with them? And the fact of the matter is, if you peel back the onion, most of them end up in administrative segregation. And so when I was in Wisconsin, I started looking at that and, and finding some solutions for that. Um, but the bottom line is, and I, th I think everybody knows here, that my predecessor was assassinated by an individual who spent seven years in segregation 
and was then released directly into the community, um, something we haven't done since March of 2014. We've simply stopped doing that. But his vision was segregation reform, and unfortunately he was murdered before um, he could really start doing that. So um, I was appointed for one reason by Governor Hickenlooper, and that was to fulfill what we felt was Mr. Clement's vision on reducing solitary um, confinement. And we've done it. It can be done. Um, I hear about how difficult it is to change culture. I hear about how difficult it is to change practice. But what we did, we did in a year and a half. And here's what we did. In 2011, we had 1,500 people in administrative segregation, which was almost 7% of our population. Uh, nationally, that's high. Today, it's less than 1%. We're still working on it. Um, it's anywhere from 130 to 170 individuals. Uh, we've decreased the amount of time someone spends in punitive segregation. Today, there is no females in administrative segregation. We were the first state uh, to um, work with our legislature and the ACLU to enact a statute that prohibits anybody that is seriously mentally ill from being placed in segregation. And, you know, when you think about that, um, putting someone that is mentally ill in a 7 by 13 foot cell, which is the size of ours, by themselves 23 hours a day and let the demons chase them around in there, makes no sense. Releasing someone from segregation directly into the community absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. You might as well stamp or turn the prison on their forehead. And so we've, we've stopped that. And what we've done, and successfully done, is that we treat the problem that causes someone to go into segregation to begin with. We have two facilities that are um, solely dedicated to the mentally ill, and I'll uh, release some data later for the first time that shows that um, not only is this the right thing to do, but it's something that we should do. You're showing your your evidence so far suggests, Mr. Ramage, that that these practices are are working. Our institutions. I here's what's what's happened is that. And I'll speak only for Colorado and let the other states speak for themselves. Um, I got my executive staff together and said, we've lost sight of our mission. And our mission is not to run a more efficient institution, which is why we see the overuse of solitary confinement or segregation or the whole or whatever you want to call it. That's a noble goal. That's not our mission. Our mission is public safety. And when you send someone out worse than they came in, we failed in our mission. So. What we've done is gotten back to our mission, which is public safety. And what I thought would happen when we started these reforms is happening. Our inmate on staff assaults are the lowest since 2006. I got some data from one of our mental health institutions where individuals there are severely mentally disabled. When I first came to Colorado, I banned the use of administrative segregation in that facility. And, and again, it was because you can't, the people have been in there for, in segregation for years in those facilities because they were so disruptive. Um, I would visit them on occasion and find that these individuals didn't even know they were in prison, let alone what planet they were on. And we stopped that and we started treating the problem. So as a result, and I'll release this today for the first time, this is, any researcher will say you can't use this data because it's, it's fresh, it's raw, it's, it's a year and a half. Um, but it is what it is. So in this one facility that has the most difficult population in the state of Colorado, within one year, the use of special controls, and if you don't know what that is, that's a very kind term for restraining someone heavily and putting them in a cell by themselves. The use of special controls has decreased by 93%. Forced cell entries have decreased by 77%. Offender on staff assaults have decreased by 46%. When we first started this, a sergeant sent an email to the executive staff saying, you're going to get someone killed. I talked to that same sergeant a few months ago who said, unsolicited, that in his mind, incidences have decreased by 80%. Mr. Ramish, this is not to compare at all with the harrowing experience that Shaka has so compellingly 
um, told us about, but you decided to go into ADSEG yourself for a day or two. And I'm sitting next to a gentleman that it actually embarrasses me that I that I did that, and I and I fully admit um, that that is a grain of sand on a beach. Um, but I did that to uh, begin to change the um, the way my officers uh, think and to start these reforms. Uh, when I got out of um, segregation, I. Um, wrote up uh, what I felt would be good for an internal newsletter. Um, ultimately, that ended up as an op-ed in the New York Times, and uh, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say that it started the, the debate on the use of or overuse of solitary confinement. I wish I could. Um, but I will say it threw a whole bunch of gasoline on it. And, uh, you know, I, um, it was an experience that, um, Internally, uh, or externally, I should say, it, it, it took off and started the, started the storm. Um, internally, if I still think about it, what I think about is I wish I would have done it 40 years ago when I was a deputy in the Dane County Jail out of Madison, Wisconsin. Maybe none of us would be here today. Um, and the other is that it really, it, it didn't take long to understand that no good could come from being in a in a segregation cell, and I, I think that when you think about it, it's you th you take a step back and you look at what's going on and you say, "What the hell are we doing?" Because you know it's not right, and it's not the right way to treat a human being, and um, all the reasons why someone is supposedly is in there. Um, I would now probably be arguing, uh, arguing the opposite. The, the other thing that uh, you need to think about is that, you know, if I were to stand before you and say, <clears throat> I've had Labradors all my life, I love Labradors, and if I were to say to you, I keep my Labrador in a cage 23 hours a day, I'd have the Humane Society knocking on my door, in fact, probably kicking my door and arresting me for abusing animals. And yet, that's what we do to, to individuals, and this is a practice that I believe now um, it's a tool that should no longer be in the toolbox for, for the most part. And there are those that say, well, what about the most dangerous people? Well, I have an inmate population of about 20,000. I have one, one individual that I am too concerned to, to let out because uh, he's been clinically diagnosed and has said that um, I've been in here and and um, you've left me alone and I've left you alone, but if I come out, I'm going to kill someone, and he will. And that doesn't mean you give up. It just means you try something a little bit a little bit different, but right now it's it's too dangerous to have him out. But that's one. We can deal with the ones of the world. We're going to do um, just a couple of questions amongst the panel, and then I'm going to open it up for audience Q&A in about 15 minutes or so. Um, Professor Haney, you have been monitoring this debate and doing this research on solitaire for years and years. What kinds of changes have you noticed amongst the populations that you research in terms of their attitudes about solitary confinement? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I uh, I thought that the scene from Star Wars that Nick was going to show us was the very last one, um, where uh, where they had where where there were, where there was an opening of about four feet wide, and 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 the missile had to go right into that opening in order for the Death Star to blow up, because as recently as five years ago, that's what the mission to change solitary confinement practices in the United States seemed like to somebody who's been at it for 35 or 40 years. And there has been, I think, uh, a real sea change. Somebody at our meeting yesterday talked about a tectonic shift, and it may very well be, be one. Um, there, we're talking about these issues, and today's gathering is an example of it, in ways that we haven't really ever in this country. And you've uh, cited the various people who have opined about the harms of solitary confinement. And I think it's part of a, bar a broader questioning of practices that we as a country have been engaged in unthinkingly, frankly, for almost the last 40 years. There has been relatively little debate about mass incarceration until really a decade ago. The, the term began to be used and began to be used in a critical sense 
and people began to look carefully at what we were doing and there is no more questionable harmful practice that mass incarceration has brought us you know it's it's a practice that is not only harmful but it is differentially harmful in my experience it is differentially visited upon not only the vulnerable and the mentally ill but also prisoners of color those are the people who end up in these units um, and in the same way that mass incarceration has had a differential impact on different groups in this society, to, so too has this most harmful practice. And again, I think there is a broader consciousness, a broader consciousness about pu a punitive response as opposed to more humane and more effective alternatives. The debate over solitary confinement, I think, is a, is a long overdue part of that renewed, renewed questioning and search for alternatives. Shaka Sangor, I can't imagine um, you having a hard time getting anybody to listen to you. You're a memoirist, you're a, a speaker, you now work for Cut 50. Uh, demand for your, your story and, and these issues higher in your experience now? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of amazing things going on in this space, but I, I really want to just really use this time as wisely as possible, right? Because I'm, I'm listening to the, the language, and I think that one of the things that happens is that we don't really visualize what that looks like. So when we talk about the overuse of solitary confinement, right, most people probably think it's just the worst of the worst that ends up in this space. But you can end up in solitary confinement for the most trivial of reasons in prison. And then what happens is there's this cycle that keeps you stuck in solitary confinement. So you go, let's just say you decide you don't want to sit at a table in a child hall with somebody for whatever reason. An officer says, well, you have to sit at that table. And you're like, well, I really don't want to sit at this table, so I'd rather leave. You can end up in solitary confinement for creating a disruption in a child hall. Then once you get in that environment, minor refractions will keep you in there. So it's a lot of guys who have served in long-term solitary confinement based on things that they've done or they've been accused of doing while they was in solitary confinement, and it keeps the cycle going. And they're really superficial, like really, it's really some bullshit, right? So, <laughs> like for example, when they was doing the census, right? They came to my door and was like, you have to fill out this census form. I'm like, I'm not filling out a census, I'm not a resident of this county. They wrote me a misconduct. That, in turn, could have kept me in solitary confinement longer. And so there are people who are dealing with mental illness who may not be as responsive as somebody when they come to the cell and say, hey, return your food tray. If you're dealing with mental illness and you haven't finished eating, your natural inclination may be to finish to eat your meal. So what ends up happening is not only are you written a misconduct that keeps you in solitary confinement further, you're also put on what's called food loaf, or this horrible mixture of, of, of food that you're subject to for seven days. So we don't talk about those level of abuses. We don't talk about what it does to the officers who actually have complete dominant control in the environment and that they use these different uh, uh, methods to actually subdue. When you talk about the statistics, the cell entry. So you don't return a small carton of milk. That's grounds for six people coming in and jumping on you, pummeling you, and restraining you to a bed. That's what we do to people in this country. I remember I stopped going to the yard. We go to, they, they put uh, handcuffs on you attached to a dog leash and walk you out to a dog kennel. And a lot of times in the winter in Michigan, they don't want you to go to yard. So to discourage you, they will actually leave you out there longer than intended time, and you're not out there with a thick winter coat on, you're out there with a flimsy state jacket on and the flimsiest of shoes that are allowed in solitary confinement. So one day I was taken out there and I was left out there for almost two hours to the point that I actually thought I was gonna like, my toes was gonna freeze, and so I stopped going out there. And so what that does is that, exasperates the anger. You know, it makes you frustrated, it makes you angry. And if you don't have an outlet, then what are, what are you supposed to do other than see these people as enemies and as people who are antagonizing and who are really a serious threat? And so that part of, when you're talking about public safety, if your officers, if they are suffering from some type of mental illness that makes it okay for them to abuse those who are most vulnerable, specifically those dealing with mental illness, how can you expect somebody to come out of that environment and adjust and adapt to society as a healthy human being? And we've allowed that to happen on our watch. And to me, again, I go back to saying this is America's greatest shame. I'm fortunate. And trust me, I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm not the, the standard of which comes out of solitary confinement. And I'm fortunate for two reasons. 
one, I read this book called Cages of Steel, which really broke down the, the whole genesis of the use of solitary confinement and maximum security prisons in America as a tool to disrupt the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, the Native American Indian Movement, et cetera. And in it, it detailed what's supposed to happen to you when you're in solitary confinement. It tells you that you'll start becoming paranoid. It tells you that you're likely to start hallucinating. It tells you that you're likely to start becoming hopeless and angry and bitter and frustrated and all these things. And so as I watched these things begin to develop, I was able to counter them. And then the second thing is I, I was literate. Like the average literacy rate in prison, the average guy in there has a third grade education, third grade reading level. So for me, I was fortunate I was able to read Mandela and read Invictus and understand that words were power. And that if I, if I can escape through these words, I can actually leave here with some semblance of my mind still intact. And so I was fortunate, and that's not the norm. And so we have to think about those who don't have that skill set, those who aren't aware what's really happening to them on our watch, and especially those who suffer from mental illness. So that's our responsibility to really correct this thing, and it's easily doable. You talked about corrections officers, yeah. and that consistently remains one of the pockets of resistance to change in this area. After the recent settlement in Pelican Bay, uh, union officers in California express reservations. There have been ongoing reservations expressed by uh, officers in um, New York, in Rikers. Rick Ramish, how have you managed to uh, talk to your own people about effecting change? When you get your staff together and you ask them, let me get this straight so I understand that this person is too dangerous to be in a maximum security general population with trained correctional officers so you keep them in solitary and then you release them directly to the community. Now, who wants to live next to that person? Raise your hand. And they get that because no one raises, raises their hand. And then when you keep your data and show that, in fact, you're making a safer facility, therefore a, face, a safer community, by doing what you're doing by decreasing, extremely decreasing the use of segregation, they get that too. And then when you remind them what their true mission is, which is community safety, they get that too. And I, it doesn't matter if they're a member of a strong union. It doesn't matter if they're a member of no union. What matters is they take pride in their profession, and I've got a professional staff. And what I tell them, this is on us, this isn't on them. What I've told them is that they're very professional, they're very educated, they're trained well, but we've been teaching them the wrong things. And now we're teaching them the right things. And I say to you, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question right now, I have a brand new Supermax that's empty. Anybody want to buy it? Well, then I'm going to turn it into a reentry center. Professor, I'm sorry to say I'm a professional skeptic, and I just don't know that some of these officers are with the program around the country. What have you seen in your research? Well, I, I think. Um, I, I, I think about it for a moment. We've been doing this for a long time in this country, and most correctional officers have grown up in a system where they've never known anything else. Um, it's be, it, solitary confinement, putting people in the hole, slamming them down, has been the go-to solution for several decades in corrections in this country. And I think absent an intervention like the one that Rick did in Colorado, people do what they've been trained to do and what they've always done. Um, there has been a de-skilling of the practice of corrections. Um, we've become accustomed to using chains and shackles and cages and uh, pepper spray and stun guns, uh, all, and not just in solitary confinement, but throughout the prison system. Uh, and I think when, when people have, have learned to use those techniques of control and nothing else, then it's difficult for them to make the transition. It has to come, I think it has to come from the top, and if you're working in a system where, that's, where that leadership's not being shown, that's not, that's not gonna evolve naturally. Um, and, and, but I think the places where, where there is that kind of change, 
being made and 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 being explained. I mean, I, I, it it too doesn't need just to be forced on people because they'll resist it. But when it's explained and it's explained in some of the ways you've just heard explained, um, people respond to it, understand it, especially if you can show results uh, and teach people a different way of doing things. Yeah, I I, I um I agree. I think the culture. You know, one of the things that, you know, in my experience of being in, in prison in Michigan is there's a racial dynamic to the police and culture that when you look at what's happening in, in outside in society where we have these constant occasions of young black men getting shot and killed by officers, that mentality exists inside of prison. Um, you know, you have prisons that when the prison boom took off, these prisons landed in all these rural spaces where there was no normal interaction between inner city kids and you know rural kids who were actually growing up being correction officers. So there's a very, very deeply rooted, um, you know, sense of dehumanization that takes place based on these racial dynamics, and uh, and we don't we don't talk about it. It's not comfortable. Even the, even the best of of administrators, um, it's hard for them to talk about that dynamic. You know that it's and it's just hard, and whether it's in personal conversations or on these platforms, that's a hard reality for us to deal with: is the racial dynamic and the implications of mass incarceration and specifically solitary confinement, and it plays out over and over again. And then also the mental health of the officers in that environment. That's important. It is really I can't even imagine how an officer can work in this environment for ten years and be clinically diagnosed as being insane. Because there's some part of your humanity that has to be broken in order for you to subject other human beings to the barbaric treatment that is the norm in that environment. So, um, We are going to open this up to audience questions. If you could limit your question to an actual interrogation instead of a lot of personal statements so we can get as many questions in as possible. There are microphones set up um, at the left and right. Please jump in. And introduce yourself, if you could, before you ask the question. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi. I'm, um, my name is Ed Rush. I'm the um, New York State Legislative Director for the Working Families uh, Organization. Uh, my question is for Rick. Um, Kerry asked you about um, how you got the officers to go along with it. And I think what you shared with us was more how you got your um, senior staff to go along with it. Did you get any pushback from the union? You know, I, um, the union pres uh, presence in Colorado is, is not very strong, but um, part of this is you can't succeed if you don't have the correctional officers and, and the staff that are actually doing the work with you on it. And so um, I, I can't say that we all grabbed each other's hands and skipped down the hallway singing Kumbaya. Um, because there was some pushback. But the, the majority of officers, because when we did this, we had to rewrite. I, I said yesterday that not only was there no map, there was no road. And we had to invent a number of things and um, a lot of bumps in the road. But what we did do was we had a lot of our correctional officers, a lot of our staff involved in the process so that it was, they had ownership to it. And, um, you know, we, uh, what I say about my executive staff is that I've got a bunch of jet fighter pilots. I give them the target and I let them figure out how to get there. And that was a lot of, of what we did here. So there was a lot of input from the, from the officers themselves. Um, some that had been around for a long time, some of the veteran officers um, didn't like it, don't like it, and won't like it, but they're professional enough to know that um, that's the the vision. That's the direction we've gone, and and you know some obviously have retired, some have moved on, uh, but uh, the majority of the officers are, are have bought into this. You, sir. Uh, Eric Peterson with Virginia Cure. Um, I, I a question for Rick. Since you've been in the system a long time, do you know how? Uh, 50 years ago or 60 or 70 years ago, I don't think we did this. Um, um, prison was, uh, my mother actually went to Charles Street Prison in Boston and had a picture taken with a number across. I mean, we all knew where it was and everything because uh, I lived in the area. Um, but 
where did where do we start getting this? We we never did that before, as far as I know. Um, 50, 70 years ago, it, it's just a phenomenon that's come on. We've become punishment oriented, and and I don't understand how we got there. You know, I actually um, in the 1800s, the Quakers. Um, felt that the way to reform people was to completely isolate them and then they would self-reflect with all this time on their hands and, and quote, cure themselves. Um, they very quickly discovered that what it actually did was drive people insane. And so they stopped the practice and the rest of us kept it. And it started out as uh, for those that are too violent to remain in the population, uh, they were placed in, in solitary and isolated. The problem is during the get tough on crime and overcrowded prisons and the inability to manage populations was that it morphed into something where I said before it was used to run a more efficient institution, which meant that if someone had a big mouth or someone may have taken an extra apple or whatever you want to you want to call it, they broke the rules and they were thrown into solitary confinement because it was the steel door solution. Put them in, slam the door, walk away, and problem's over. Um, actually, the problem's being multiplied or at best suspended. But as the level system was mentioned, what happened then is that most states, including Colorado, adopted what was called a level system. With that level system was that you had to make it through level one, you'd get to level two, you'd get to level three, maybe four, and then if you got through four, you would be taken out of, out of solitary. The unfortunate thing is that if you went through level one and you went through level two and then you had a bad day in level two, you went back to level one. Now, I'm pretty sure no one in here ever has a bad day, but, but I personally do, and I know that under those circumstances that we held offenders to, you couldn't succeed. And so one year turned into two years, turned into five years, turned into 15 years. We had a person in Colorado that was in solitary confinement for 24 years. Think of that. Now we threw out the level system and what we determined was that when someone goes in, they ought to know when they're coming out and the absolute maximum that they can spend is one year. And even that, if it's one year, that's for those that commit murder, rape, or serious assaults. All the other stuff we're finding other alter alternatives to, and you know what? It's working. Those that are coming out, those that are going through our step-down programs, very few of them are returning back to, back to segregation. And I might add that every inmate that I've talked to that has come out of solitary confinement, they pretty much say the same thing. They say, I don't want to go back. They don't say, I'm never going to do that again because there's a disconnect there. They don't want to go back, but that's not going to correct their conduct. And the, and the point is, it doesn't work. And it hasn't worked for 100 years. And so that's why in Colorado we've changed. Hi there. Hi, I'm Eric Lotke, president of the Prison Policy Initiative. I think in some ways my question might have been anticipated by that one just then uh, and by Professor Haney's remarks on de-skilling. But I'm going to try it anyway. I'm, I'm curious what the incentives are so that we understand why politicians want to be tough on crime and we understand why prison towns want jobs and we understand why you know fat people want to eat and oil companies want to pollute and all the rest of it but this has grown in recent years and as it's been growing 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 surely it has been not working 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 and rick ramish's data are intuitive and and officers surely experience that you put him in and he was he was he was an pesky inmate now he's worse when he came out why is it growing what's the incentive why why has this been continuing and continuing well <clears throat> i you know i think it's important for us all to acknowledge that this is um that this is something we've all participated in as a society um and the use and overuse of solitary confinement is the natural extension of 40 years of unthinking, tough on crime. People who commit crime do so because they're bad, evil people, because they're monsters, and because they deserve, and, and therefore they deserve to be punished and punished harshly. We've decontextualized crime. We don't think about the causes of crime. We simply attribute it to the people who engage in it. We demonize them. We put them in prison to be punished, not rehabilitated, punished for what they've done, and when they 
violate rules, even trivial rules, as Shaka talked about, then they get punished more. And even in solitary confinement units, as you may know, if you violate a rule there, there's another place they send you. <laughs> so it, it, it's, a, it's a very myopic view of the nature of crime, of who engages in crime, who in, in prison, who engages in disciplinary infractions, that in, in, entirely decontextualizes it and blames only the individual and therefore justifies their punishment. That has to be deconstructed. Until and unless we deconstruct that from the beginning to the end, and as a society we've only just begun to do that, then solitary confinement to people who work in these units seem like a natural extension of what, of, of what the larger society is doing. Not asking who is engaging in these infractions and why, and what can be done other than punishing them, but simply doing what correctional officers see the larger society doing. And we've all done that. We've all participated in this narrative, in this rhetoric where we've demonized people. We've demonized people who've engaged in actions that may need to be punished, may need, may need to, where there may need to be culpability, but we've, we've, simply, we've simply taken off the limits to what we are as a society willing to do. That's why a human dignity approach to this is, is, is the right way to think about it, not in terms of economics, but in terms of human beings at the other end of this process of punishment, valuable human beings, um, resources that are being lost to the larger society because we refuse to understand the value that they could and would contribute to the society if we simply understood them differently and reacted to whatever they did in very different ways. Let me, let me add a bit to that, too. At, at, at one point, and you, you, I don't know when, and I, and I wonder when, it becomes accepted practice. Whether it's right or wrong, it becomes accepted. Now, I'll give you an example of this, and Shaka probably can give many more, but, you know, when I spent that night in, in segregation, one of the first things people talk about in corrections is, well, we have to keep people from communicating. They're too dangerous. They're gang members. They're drug dealers. They're whatever. So one of the first things I was told was by the warden, who's a very progressive warden, put a towel down on, your, on the bottom of your door because you're new the other inmates are going to be fishing sending me messages some intimidating and so you don't get those put the towel down well if they can't communicate and all night long I heard people shouting back and forth among each other they were communicating and then you hear and he told me this afterwards I wish he would have told me before because I didn't get any sleep <laughs> And the reason I didn't get any sleep, and I've been in, anybody in corrections, we've been in seg cells a hundred times, never spent any time there. But when you spend the night there, a couple of things you realize. From a manager's point of view, I was proud of my staff that every half hour shook my door. From trying to sleep point of view, it isn't <laughs> happening. And so not only are you isolated, you're sleep deprived. And then when I got out, the warden says, well, you know, Rick, most of the inmates take toilet paper and stick it in their ears. And he said that as a matter of fact, of that's the accepted practice. And so what we need to do, what some of us are doing, is we're taking a step back and we're going, what the hell are we doing? And that's what needs to be done. Next question, please. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm um, Perry Gadurgis. I am working and developing a, a um, television series called 100 Less Court Dates and a Wake Up, uh, stories about successful reentry, and was formerly incarcerated myself, had uh, some exposure to solitary, and also, you mentioned, I, I also used to fish uh, <laughs> across to one of my um, buddies. My question is, and I have a, uh, I've been out 37 years, and I've worked in the addiction field and the mental health field, and, and nowhere in this conversation, I've, as I've been researching this particular film for the last couple years, is the issue of medication as it relates to mental health. And, and my observation in the 70s when I was in, in the Maryland correction system was that um, there was a phrase called the Thorzine Shuffle. And Thorzine had been so incredibly overused. And I wonder from each one of you and your points of view, I'd be really curious as to professionally or, or personally your feelings about the use of, of medication around or the lack of and the pros and cons 
of the use of that, particularly what the, the mental health concerns or diagnosis. Um, so. I, I, got, I know from a personal standpoint, um, I was I was shocked when I first went to prison and realized like how many people suffer from mental illness and how they were treated. And just to watch guys just like zombie like on the yard. Uh, but then I thought about it, my father worked in the mental health field. They closed all of the mental health hospitals down in Michigan. And so the natural outcome was for them, the men and women to end up in uh, prison. And oftentimes, so what, what happens from a personal standpoint in prison, which is very difficult, as I, I can imagine uh, for people running prison, it's very difficult as this. Men and women who have mental illness, when they're placed in solitary confinement, or placed in general population, uh, they're very, they're extremely vulnerable. They're vulnerable for a couple of reasons. If you're having a psychotic episode and your next door neighbor doesn't understand schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, he's not going to come out and say that you want some medicine. He's going to come out and knock you over your head and stab you and throw you off a tear. Um, and so that's the reality of prison is that mental illness is just immersed in that environment in a way that's not healthy, whether it's general population or whether it's solitary confinement. Because the reality is that we just need to decriminalize mental illness. That like that's the simple solution, right? Give people the real treatment that they deserve. Like if you was had any other type of illness, you know, you wouldn't go to prison for it. And mental disease is that's a real thing. It's not like some, you know, fictional thing that people who have schizophrenia they're gonna do things that may technically be criminal. But can we hold them criminally responsible? And to do so is really just stupid, in my opinion. Like, these people need real treatment. They need to be around health care providers that really have their best interests at heart, not just doping them up to keep them quiet or silenced, but actually to help them heal. So We've, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think that, in fact, we have gotten away from that. Um, Colorado or just? Well, I can speak for Colorado. And... And what I can say is we had a professor from a liberal university out at one of our mental health institutions, prisons, um, a, a month or so ago. And we were visiting with some severely mentally disabled inmates. And you want to talk about sad state of affairs for America. What I was thinking was they're too disabled to be in prison. They can't, they can't function in general population. They simply can't, yeah. which is why they're, they're in a residential treatment program. His comment to me from a liberal university was, they're probably safer here than they are out in the community. And I thought, that is a sad state of affairs for, for the United States. Can I just, I just want to add one quick thing on that. I go to prison systems around the country, and I can tell you that Colorado is a positive outlier in this regard. The modal form of mental health care in prisons in the United States in solitary confinement and outside is medication. Um, it, there is underreporting of the um, of the number of people who are mentally ill. Again, outside of solitary confinement as well as inside, um, a a prisoner in solitary confinement is lucky to be seen by any kind of clinical staff of any level of expertise uh, more than once a week, and oftentimes that's for a pro forma check in. How are you? How are you doing? You're not thinking about hurting yourself, are you? And they're lucky if they get one check in with a psychiatrist, which nowadays is oftentimes done through telepsychiatry. You sit down in front of a camera and talk to a doctor over a camera who asks you, How are your meds? Are they fine? Are you having any problem? Are you sleeping okay? Fine, I'll see you in a month. Yeah. That's the way we do it. We are running very low on time. Just one last question, ma'am. My name is Leah Labresco. I'm a journalist at 538. Um, I'm curious, uh, for Mr. Ramish, um, the data you were giving on forced entry sounded like data you probably kept track of before reforms. I'm wondering if as you were reforming solitary confinement, there's anything new you started keeping track of? And for Professor Haney, whether there's anything you would hope people are keeping track of? Well, because this is new ground, we're keeping track of virtually everything. I mean, we're, we're keeping track of, of are our reforms working? Have the incidences of violence gone up or gone down? Um, are the individuals that are going through our step-down programs, are they, um, are they making it in general population? You know, one thing people don't really think about is when we started these initiatives, we had about 200 people that refused to come out of, of solitary confinement. And we felt it was too ironic to physically remove them from something we probably physically put them in to begin with. So. Um, 
we tracked our reforms that we used to get them out. Um, I call it at the door, open door therapy, where the clinicians would go to the door and, and try and coax them out. Uh, we would give them additional items. Um, therapy dogs work very, very well to get them out. And so all of that is, is being tracked so that we can do a, a white paper on, on what it is that we've, that we've accomplished and so that hopefully we can give that to other states and those that are interested. But we're tracking everything. Again, Colorado is an outlier in this regard. Um, we keep track of almost nothing uh, with respect to solitary confinement around the United States. The Yale Law School just came out with a path-breaking article in which we have for the first time been able to estimate the number of people who are in solitary confinement, just the number, let alone what's happening to them while they're there, what the effects of it are on them. One area that we haven't looked at at all, and even people like myself who've been studying this for a very long time, lose track of people when they leave the, the environment. So you can, you can track people, you can interview them, you can assess what's happening to them while they're in the prison, but once they're gone, they're gone. And we have very little data, if any, on what happens to people who've been in these kinds of environments once they leave. But it, it's a massive black hole of information. Uh, and again, Colorado is beginning to, to collect the kinds of things that need to be collected, but most other systems are not. I want, can I just add one thing? Uh, I, I really would love to see like some research on the usage of food loaf as basically a form of torture, in my opinion. You starve people, uh, yeah, and like like why they why do they use that? Uh, but I also think one of the one of the scariest things is that we live in a society where the majority of taxpaying citizens have absolutely no idea what happens in the prisons in their communities, and I think we need to change that. I think that. The more that we investigate as citizens, the more that we hold officials accountable, the more that we start really challenging people to open up the doors of prison so we can see what's happening, uh, I think we'll be better off. I think that we should be present at parole board hearings. I think that we should know what solitary confinement looks like, uh, whether it's being able to go inside and, and, and have those experiences. But I think that's our responsibility overall. Like we can't just allow uh, you know, uh, you know, trusted to police officials and administrators and wardens, like, you know, they need to be held accountable as well. And that's our responsibility to ensure that that's taking place. A fitting way to end. Please join me in thanking these brilliant gentlemen. Thank you.